which was a very proud moment for the town. Uh, but now we have four, which is wonderful news and a real learner -ner to anyone who says Reading has no culture because we can prove it. We have four. So I just wanted to say congratulations uh, for the um, subsequent MPO for the Museums Partnership, Reading, which is Merle and Reading Museum, Ready Pop and Culture Mix, and a big congratulations for Jelly for becoming an MPO this year. So I don't ask you, Councillor Rowland, a round of applause, I think, for our MPOs. Right, then on to the actual agenda. Any declarations of interest? Okay, have you got any apologies? Okay, I've got Kitchingham. Yeah, okay. Um, and then the minutes of the last meeting held in June. Anyone got any comments or accuracy to uh, update? No? Okay, I'll get those approved. And then we have minutes of the Community Safety Partnership meeting, which is pages 15 to 22, just for noting. Everyone noted those? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have no petitions. Um, we do have questions from councillors. So we have half an hour to get through these questions. So question number one, uh, councillor asking to ask me about public litter bins. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is, uh, public litter bins. We have a persistent problem of overflowing bins in the parks and near bus stops, and you have to walk just 10 steps to on any street in Reading to find litter. Over the years, the amount of street litter and overflowing bins has increased, contributing to general despair among residents. One resident messaged me, I have asked my friends or visitors to meet me at the end of the road of my house because I do not want them to see uh, see them overflowing bins and litter scattered on the street. I want to be proud, not ashamed of where we live. We want the area to be clean and safe. Will the lead councillor for environmental services and community safety lend her support to increase the frequency of bin collections from the local parks, near bus stops and street cleaning? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I invite Councillor Rowland, the lead councillor for Environment Services, Community Safety, to make a response on my behalf. Thank you, Chair, and I thank Councillor Singh for his question. There are approximately 2,000 residential street litter and dog waste bins across the borough's network with a further 370 within our parks and open spaces. The schedules for emptying of all litter bins are based on fixed rotational scheduling for expediency and managing workloads. Litter bin emptying frequencies are scheduled depending on the location with high use areas, town center, district shopping areas, parks and open spaces being attended daily, or in the case of the town center on multiple times a day. Other bins located beyond the town center are emptied at least once per week or more often if it is a high traffic area. Emptying schedules are regularly reviewed to avoid litter bins overflowing. We adjust our schedules and solutions based on evidence of an alteration in collections needed at a particular site. Where persistent overflowing of bins occurs and the capacity of the existing bin no longer meets the needs, such as at well-used bus stops or parks, either the frequency of emptying is increased or a larger capacity bin is installed to meet the requirements. When finding areas where they, there are issues, residents and ward councillors frequently ride in and the situation is reviewed and adjusted as needed. I empathize with your resident. However, when confronted with such a complaint as a councillor, you could have also immediately been an integral part of the solution in letting officers know directly of the specific area of concern so that the problem could have already been addressed. Officers always welcome that information and most issues find a quick resolution utilizing that route. Should a member of the public observe a litter bin that is overflowing or excess litter, they can report it directly and easily through our Love Clean Reading app, which our own officers use frequently themselves or by ringing our contact center at 011-893-73787. Many of our bins have labels on them as to and advise how to report them if they are overflowing. It's worth also mentioning the successful raise 
Reading Adopt Your Street initiative that has supported civic-minded residents and volunteer groups to help keep their local area clean and tidy. Our Raise Plus program is now running quite successfully with larger groups, and many are finding a real purpose, neighborly camaraderie, and satisfaction in volunteering to help keep their area tidy. An increasing misuse of litter bins by members of the public for the disposal of domestic and commercial waste has been noted. Information found relating to the misuse of these litter bins is passed to our enforcement team for further action. The concentration of this misuse is largely but not exclusively within the town center. The current government's policy of allowing permitted development of offices to residential is likely already causing this increased impact in the town center, and that is currently only destined to continue. Increases in rubbish and litter have also been noted where there are high rates of residential turnover in areas with heavy concentrations of small flats and HMOs. Transient residents are not always properly advised by agents and landlords of how recycling and rubbish collections operate in Reading. There is ongoing education with landlords and agents to ensure this information is fully shared. Officers also frequently visit these areas with informational leaflets as part of that work. The changes in circumstances or behaviors have put an additional strain on our street cleansing resources that is constrained by years of budget tightening. Working with stakeholders and the wider neighborhood service team, a revised change of work has been developed, which is soon to be implemented to provide daily clearance of domestic bags and greater enforcement of commercial waste being left on the streets. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rowland. Do you have a supplementary question? Yes, Chair. Thank you. I note in the response, uh, the persistent overflowing of bin occurs. The capacity of existing bin bins no longer meets the need. Uh, the, the frequency of emptying is increased or larger capacity bins is installed to meet requirements. Can, can that be confirmed? How many bins has been increased or the frequency increased in the parks? Do you have any numbers? to suggest that and to add uh, uh, i have reported this issues numerous times thank you councillor Rowland. thank you chair and thank you councillor singh for your follow-up um the um i do not have those numbers to hand but i can tell you that that as a lead member i am frequently uh involved and tagged on conversations wherein councillors do write in and ask for a modification if there are uh issues with uh, excess bins overflowing and things like that. So I do know that it happens on a fairly regular basis and, and they really do try to work with you. So if you're telling me that you've written in and you haven't gotten an answer, I'm happy to, I'm more than happy to have a chat with you and let's work together to get that resolved because the only way that we can really take care of it is to, to get those individual sites really under wraps, take a look at them and find that solution that's gonna work and I'm happy to try to get those numbers for you. Okay? Thank you, I appreciate Thank your you. response. Thank you very much. We have question number two, and that is from Councillor McCann on my, making our narrow pavements usable. Thank you, Chair. Um, so yes, making our narrow pavements usable, there are a number of roads in Redlands with narrow pavement, which are often impassable due to bins blocking the way, especially for people using wheelchairs or pushing buggies. The council's current policy is that bins in narrow streets will be collected from just inside a property's boundary and returned there. However, they are frequently left out. Would the council consider reminding refuse collection teams of this policy, informing residents on the relevant streets that they don't need to put their litter bins out for collection and letting the local councillors know which streets this applies to? Thank you. I invite Councillor Rowland to reply on my behalf. Thank you, Chair, and I thank Councillor McCann for her question. Recycling and waste bins on narrow pavements not only impact on residents with wheelchairs and child buggies, but also affect people with other mobility issues and the visually impaired. Your point is relevant not only in your ward, but around the borough. I'm pleased, therefore, to advise you that our waste service management team is currently addressing a body of work driven by concerns expressed at the Access and Disabilities Working Group about pavement accessibility. At their most recent meeting on the 8th of September, issues associated with narrow footpaths and waste bins were discussed. Officers advised members of the group about the guidance issued to residents regarding bins on narrow pavements and the operational management practices of waste services to mitigate the challenges experienced. 
as vice chair of that group and from the work I've been engaged in with Councillor Cross and Redlands Ward, I have ensured that the roads that you are asking about are already part of that work. From that initial meeting, several possible interventions are being considered, some of which have been immediately acted upon and others which are being worked through with the intervention with the intention of inclusion in future delivery and operating methods to continually improve accessibility on pavements. A significant problem identified was that people with sight loss issues especially were not being able to easily spot the small dark colored food waste caddies on the pavement. This doesn't just affect narrow pavements, but is a general issue throughout the borough. To avoid this hazard, officers have been working diligently with crews to ensure food caddies are placed back inside the curtilage of the property as general operational procedure for all properties. The, this focus of operational improvements will also reduce these bins being blown down the street in windy conditions, reducing damaged bins. The broader body of work, however, is to be undertaken in addressing specific street and area issues as they emerge on a case-by-case -case basis. You, you highlight issues in your ward, but there are a variety of similar issues throughout the town, which will require intervention to be tailored to a specific road and its unique geographical challenges. This work is recognizing that bespoke arrangements as far as practicable may be required in some instances. Our approach, which has been in practice for many years, has been found to be broadly successful, but we clearly do but clearly we do know that there are issues, which is why the work spurred on by the Access and Disability Working Group is so important. For information, the council provides the following guidance on its website. Where there is no pavement or the pavement is narrow adjoining a property, i.e. the property is just next to the road, residents must place their bin, bag, or box on collection day just inside the curtilage of the property adjacent to the edge of the road. This is accompanied by the further infographic that you see displayed for you there. We do not currently hold a list of streets to which this guidance applies and apply a common sense approach in undertaking our statutory waste collection duties. Our staff are aware of the above guidance and are required to act in accordance with it. This requires a dynamic approach in the presentation of waste bins and the return of the bin following collection, as no one solution is correct for all streets or even for all properties within a single street. In tailoring those bespoke responses where long-term challenges on narrow roads present themselves, there are the logistical pressures on the team to clear the roads in an efficient fashion that have to be coordinated alongside the cooperation of residents as part of the solution to resolving particular street issues. Where there are issues found to be occurring within a location on a regular basis, our adopted course of action would be to write to all residents of that street or road to remind them of the council's waste presentation guidance and their role in supporting its successful delivery alongside continual training and education of our waste collection staff. I am optimistic that the work progressing around the Access and Disabilities Working Group and with the university around streets in your area will deliver proper accessibility for persons with accessibility issues around the town. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rowland. Do you have a supplementary? Just a very brief one. Thank you very much for the reply. Um, I really like that guidance. I think it's fantastic, but I just don't know if everybody would be aware of it. I know you said that if there's a persistent problem, then people would be advised on it. Might it be possible to make that a standard thing that all of those streets where it is a challenge, they could automatically get a, an alert through the post or drop through their door? I would be very happy to do some posting if necessary. <laughs> Councillor Rowland. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor McCann, for your follow-up. Um, the the infographic there is uh, as I uh, available on our website and available generally. So I'm sure that something could be arranged. And um, you know, as with any councillor, and especially when we're talking about dealing with a bespoke solution to really ensuring accessibility on our pavements uh, you know if you want to get involved you want to sit down there and list out streets areas things like that specifically uh, please feel free to come to us uh, I know that there's a member of your party that sits on the disabled access and working group uh, which you should seek to engage with with uh, her and ensure that that as this work progresses and everything we're, we're achieving the right answers but uh, you know um, Bob's your uncle. I mean, uh, anything is possible. That information is readily available. So, yeah, thank you. Right, thank, thank you, you. Councillor.
Thank you. That's the end of the questions from the public and councillors. Um, we have no decision book references. So now we're on to item seven, which is the annual update on the operation of leisure facilities by Greenwich Leisure Limited. So welcome to you and we look forward to your presentation. Chair, could I give a just a very brief up to introduction? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so I will keep it very brief um, because GLL are going to be presenting an update on the performance since July 2021. Um, I would just ask the committee just to note the progress made in securing the £1.5 million worth of Sport England funding to contribute towards the projects at Rivermead and Palmer Park. But I will now hand over to Craig Woodward and Steph Smith from GLL. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Much appreciated. Um, good evening, everybody. Hope you're all well. Um, yeah, just introductions, as, as Donna mentioned. My name's Craig Woodward, Partnership Manager for Reading, and this is Steph Smith to my right, who's the Healthy Community Manager for Reading as well. Um, so just move on to a bit of background information on the next slide, if possible, please. Thank you very much. Um, so a little bit of background information for those that you may not be aware. Um, obviously, you signed a 25 year contract uh, July last year. So on the 1st of July 2021, for 25 years for the operation of the four leisure centres in Reading. Um, it's Meadway, South Reading, Palmer Park and then obviously the continuation of Rivermead, which we've been in operation for many years now. Part of the contract was to um, is, is to rebuild two of the leisure facilities, one at, Palm, uh, one at Rivermead and the second one at Palmer Park. Rivermead is complete re replacement of what's currently there, whereas Palmer Park, as I'm sure most of you will know, is a new six lane, 20, uh, six lane 25 metre community pool, along with the gym and studios, which go above it. Um, across the 25 years of contract, there's a £40 million investment as well. I'll just give you a little bit of, um, on the next slide if possible, please, just give you some information on the centres as a whole and the works that have taken place and are ongoing. So Palmer Park um, is due to open on Monday the 19th of December. With the first two weeks going to be over the Christmas period, so we're going to have them slightly reduced schedule during the Christmas times. So obviously, a very, very quiet time of, of year normally. The new name for Palmer Park will be to try and encompass everything is Palmer Park Leisure Centre and Stadium. Still to keep the stadium, um, which is obviously quite unique, uh, not many of them around at all. But also to tie into the fact that there is more of a leisure offer in there now, particularly along the swimming pool. The works that are being completed and are very nearly to be finished is a new six lane 25 metre pool, which has got a changing village as well, and also area for changing places. It's a 100 station gym, which sits above the pool and has uh, uh, visuals of, uh, of the park around as well. Absolutely fantastic uh, views. The, there's a cafe open at the bottom, uh, which is available for the community. Also installing the children's soft play, along with studios and group cycle, uh, a group cycle studio as well, which is the, the spin for those of you who have ever taken place. Um, still extremely, extremely popular. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Rivermead Lens Centre is continuing to progress, um, as I'm sure many of you again have seen. Um, due to open in 2023, which has a eight lane 25 metre competition pool, um, along with a diving pool with movable floor, which also doubles up as a teaching pool as well. Um, again, this is includes a changing area and a village changing area with changing places facilities too. There's also going to be a splash pad included as well, which is quite a unique feature. Not many of them around, and I, to my knowledge, there's no others in Reading as well. Um, again, another large gym going upstairs as well, so 120 station this one, all state-of-the-art equipment. The sports hall will be a six-court six sports hall, so that's six badminton courts, um, which is usually how the sports halls are measured. Um, again, cafe and soft play too, and this one will have two extremely large studios at the top as well and a group cycle studio included as well. Um, I've included visuals on the right hand side for those of you who've not spotted them already, so apologies for not pointing them out already. If we can move forward to the next slide, please. Um, South Reading Leisure Centre, uh, works were completed here from uh, back end of last year, so November last year through to February this year, reopening at the end of February. The um, During this time we obviously had the gym closed but rather than just closing that off to customers and users we managed to um, offer them access to all of the other facilities in the local area so the opportunity to use Palmer Park or venture across the Rivermead or Meadway as well just to make sure it caused as little disruption as possible. Um, works completed here was to extend the gym. Um, for those of you who have visited South Reading in the past um, many many years ago my understanding was it was squash courts either side that had obviously been transformed into, transformed into gyms in the recent years. There was a corridor that divided them both. 
Um, so we've taken the corridor out and it's opened the gym up. Um, it, it completely transformed the space, really. Uh, much more inviting sort of space now. Um, also uh, refurbished both reception and the change rooms, as well as doing some refreshment works up in the studios upstairs, both the main studio and the group cycle studio. Move forward to Meadway, please. Um, Meadway Sports Centre, very, very similar to South Reading. Um, work, uh, obviously different uh, schedule of works. Mead, uh, this one took place in March through to July. So once we had finished South Reading, to again, keep the disruption down to a minimum, we waited uh, four weeks and then started the works in Meadway. Um, very, very similar. This had um, slight extension to the gym, utilising a corridor space again, um, refreshed the change of rooms. We actually created a new studio space here. So the studio was always previously in a, in a sports hall. So the sports hall there was five badminton courts. The fifth badminton court, or the one on the very left-hand side, if you were facing it, um, was used for, uh, for classes. We had a very successful class programme anyway. What we've done is we've created a dividing wall and it actually gives it a dedicated space. Helps to increase the atmosphere. Um, means you can play music a little bit louder in there without disrupting badminton next door as well, which is always useful too. And um, if we can skip forward to the next one, please. Thank you very much. Just to touch on some usage stats as well um, of how we've performed throughout this year. Um, usage stats are at 92% of pre-COVID levels, which is uh, you know, really, really, it's moving in the right direction. It's where we need it to be. Slight uh, issue with Rivermead. We've not been able to take as many, quite as many events as we would have done in the past there. It's largely due to the fact that obviously there's a new centre being built in a large part of the car park. So it's limited as to how many events we can do. Um, 92 percent give you a rough idea of where that sits, um, particularly in GLL. We are um, in the top sort of half of, of where we're performing. So we're performing really well, um, particularly for the um, partnerships and areas outside of London. We're, we're well on our way to, to, to where we need to be. Um, We've also managed to, throughout 2022, we've offered uh, over, just over 6,000 free swims as well to local residents in Reading. Um, this is all very much linked to the um, old Your Reading Passport uh, concessionary scheme. Um, during, throughout the year, joined over 2,500 two new members as well. Um, so we've had over 2,500 new members join up, sorry, uh, um, really poorly said then, apologies. And um, both Rivermead and South Reading have also gone past pre-COVID levels as well, which is extremely good. Meadway is not too far behind as well. Um, the, uh, the obviously as well, just a little touch on there, the figures have been achieved with quite a large amount of disruptions throughout the year for both the project works at Meadway and South Reading, not to mention the two new builds at, um, at, at Rivermead and Palmer Park as well. If I can skip to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, just to go across some of the people that we've got within the, uh, within the area. So we've been putting on various qualifications to try and upskill our staff. The MPLQ, which is the National Pool Lifeguard Qualification, has been, um, we've rolled out a couple of courses there. The main aim with this is to try and get as many uh, qualified staff through as possible. What we found across the industry as a whole is staff levels have, have dropped since uh, returning back from the pandemic. And it's been quite a challenge to get particularly lifeguards and swim teachers. So we put both swim, uh, as you can see on the presentation, we put both MPO, uh, MPLQ and swim teacher courses on the idea of this is just to try and drive the numbers to make sure we've got plenty of demand for swimming lessons but we need the teachers to be able to deliver them so we've had to put these courses on the basis to getting more people qualified rather than just expecting people to come already qualified and we are real living we've got real living wage accreditation as well so we pay the real living wage with across GLL and um, continue to do e-learning sessions also going, currently going for our annual appraisals as well, just with personal development plans. It's quite key for myself personally. Um, I've worked for GLL for a number of years now and have, um, have kind of benefited myself personally from like quite a large sort of personal development plan and constant progression as well. So that's something that's personally key to me. So going to carry, continue with that. And we've also rolled out a staff member of the month scheme as well, just to make sure that we recognize uh, positive work. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, key subject at the moment, obviously energy and environment and um, how we can improve uh, um, reducing the energy costs really. So two new centres are being built to BRIAM Excellent Standard. That was part of the contract and something obviously key to, to deliver. We've had an initial investment of 1.6 million. This included things like poolside and sports hall climate controls. These are to improve the building management systems. These are <laughs> 
it's basically the computer side of it behind the scenes. So what we've got in place now is the ability to be able to set times of when certain elements of the building kicks in and turns on. So we can ramp the pool circulation pumps down overnight. So they're only just sort of keeping the, the circulation going to obviously not build up any sort of bacteria or anything. But it doesn't need to be as uh, fully used when the pool's not is uh, open. Sorry, that's really badly explained then, apologies. Um, also have pool covers installed as well to make sure we can uh, retain as much heat as possible. And we've just gone through a LED lighting upgrade as well to make sure all the lighting throughout both Meadway and South Reading are um, as energy efficient as possible. Obviously two new buildings are slightly different because they're going to be coming with that anyway. There has been a further £1 million investment or circa £1 million investment as well made to support carbon reduction. This is predominantly on air source heat pumps at uh, Meadway, Beg Pardon, River Mead and Palmer Park, uh, along with solar panels that are on the roof as well. And some of the images there will show. So the top image shows the solar panels. The bottom image, which you're not going to be able to guess, but is the air source heat pump as well. So I've just included that in there as well. And um, yeah, next slide, if possible, please. And I'll hand you over to Steph to talk health wise and community. So Healthwise is GLL's um, umbrella term for our health offer that we have here in Reading. Um, this comprises of our physical activity referral scheme, which is GP referral scheme. So this is a 12 week program where an individual gets referred by their GP. Um, they then have an initial assessment with our Healthwise coordinator and they then start on 12 weeks of physical activity sessions that are suitable to them. So far this year, we've had 244 referrals into that scheme. We also have the cardiac rehabilitation scheme, which is phase four. So this directly follows on from phase three cardiac rehab, which takes place in the Royal Berkshire Hospital. Um, there's a video on that one, so I'll, I'll skip explaining that for you. But so far, we've had 46 referrals into that. And we also run an adult weight management scheme, um, which is a 12 week um, group programme which focuses on education. So there's an hour of education sessions which focus on things like behaviour change and emotional triggers when it comes to food. And then there's an hour of exercise which follows. And we've had 137 referrals into that scheme so far this year. We have delivered um, or completed five adult weight management courses so far this year with another three which we'll complete by the end of the year, giving us a total of eight. Um, we have also had a partnership with Xyla Health, who are delivering the NHS National Diabetes Prevention Programme. So on a bi-weekly basis, they come into Rivermead and they deliver this lifestyle change programme. We then have a direct link into our Healthwise scheme from this. So there is a continuation for them once they've completed that programme. Our Healthwise coordinator has worked to create and develop relationships and referral routes into our Healthwise scheme this year. Um, so an example is the integrated pain and spine service. Um, they now have a direct route into us. So they can just send a referral over, which is really good for continuation of care. Um, we've also delivered Make Every Contact Count training to all of our frontline staff. Um, so those who deliver the clinical interventions mentioned previously, they all have that training as part of their qualification. But our receptionists and fitness instructors, etc., we have actually taken the time to put them on e-learning so that they can have meaningful conversations with general members who come in to use the gym, which has been really successful. Next slide, please. In terms of our community offer over the last year, we have had a reduced cost membership um, to encourage people to participate in physical activity within our centres. Um, so we've had um, the residence card, which provides up to 30% off on our activities for pay and play. This is a um, sort of a GLL version, I suppose, of the Your Reading Passport scheme, which we have honoured for those who were already on it. Um, additional memberships that we have are concessionary cards for those who are older, have a disability or are in receipt of benefits. That gives them up to 50% off on pay and play activities. And then we have a really big mix of different membership options. So we've got student memberships, junior memberships, um, and then your everyday memberships as well. We've also offered over 140 free memberships to Ukrainian refugees, and this offer is something that still exists now. 
other refugees are able to access the um, concessionary membership previously mentioned as well. Also for refugees, we have worked in partnership with Reading Football Club Community Trust and a charity called Care for Calais, where we've delivered free football sessions um, at Farmer Park. So whilst the centre has been closed, the outdoor five-a-side pitches have remained open. Um, and these have been really popular, especially with young male refugees. Um, our Area Swim School lead has created and developed a partnership with Level Water. Level Water are a charity who provide discounted swimming lessons for those with physical disabilities. Um, I think in October alone, we've opened up eight spaces onto our Level Water courses. Um, so they're one to one swimming sessions where our instructors yeah, are one to one with with the individual. Um, they've been really popular. We still do have a bit of a wait list for for this in Reading. So we're continually looking to try and open up more slots for these sessions. We've also introduced SEN swimming sessions at both Meadway and Rivermead. So we now have three SEN swimming sessions running across the borough. All, all three are very, very popular. We've had um, audits done on our centres um, in terms of being dementia friendly and improvements made following these. And we've also introduced a dementia friendly swimming session at South Reading. And we've also got the GLL Sport Foundation, which this year has supported eight athletes who um, have been nominated for this award. They received um, cash bursaries, uh, free memberships and other athlete services like maybe physiotherapy or, or whatever is going to help them to perform. Next slide, please. So if this video works, this is just a bit of a case study on um, Paul 70 from West Reading, who has benefited from our cardiac scheme. No. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> if this doesn't work, I can make the link available on the council's website on the agenda page. Yeah, that would be good. Thank you. No, we, we can bump asteroids, but we can never get a link to work on one of these things. But we will make it available to share. Is it available on, uh, well, is that Reading Borough Council's YouTube channel? Yes. So it's yeah. very publicly available? Yeah, yeah, Okay, cool. Yeah. Everyone can have a look at that. Lovely. Sorry about that. That's, That's all right. right. So basically, Paul is just one of the, the, the many people who have benefited from our cardiac rehabilitation scheme. So it's just going to show you um, sort of what that involves. But it is um, a 12 week structured programme. Um, where they have regular check-ins with an instructor um, and yeah it shows them using the gym and there's also some organised classes that they attend. Brilliant, thank you. So in terms of the health and community next steps for us over the next year, we are looking to improve our physical activity referral scheme. Um, we are going to continue to build our referral routes, really, um, and especially focus on areas where perhaps we receive lower referrals than we would expect to and also focus on the areas where we receive a lower uptake. So those that have been referred, if they drop out for any reason or they sort of decline starting. We are going to try and target those areas a lot more over the next year. We're also going to introduce a falls prevention pathway to this scheme um, and introduce a cancer rehabilitation scheme as well. So the falls prevention will just become part of the physical activity referral scheme, whereas the cancer rehabilitation will sit separately, similarly to the cardiac rehabilitation scheme. They actually follow a very, very similar structure. 
We will also look to develop and enhance our adult weight management service. Um, so hopefully next year deliver 12 courses, have them running back to back so there's no gap in provision because that has been a very popular service that we've run this year. And we're also going to look to improve our monthly health promotions. So at the minute we have health promotions in centres um, in terms of posters and advertising sort of health campaigns. Um, what we're going to look to do is actually partner with local organisations and charities, um, starting with uh, alcohol awareness in January and hopefully get an organisation to actually come into our centres and, and be a presence to promote them further and link this to a free taster session. In terms of community um, next steps, we are looking to introduce inclusive cycling at Palmer Park, um, working with a national charity to help us do that as well. Um, we are also improving our local partnerships, so actually going out and meeting with these community groups and listening to what they want um, and what they'd like to see within our centres and the outcomes that they are looking for. Um, just a recent example, the Whitley Community Development Association, I've met with them very recently and they've spoken about things that they would like to see at South Reading, um, especially some holiday activities to keep the kids occupied. So that's something we'll take on board and work with them in partnership to deliver. Um, we're also looking at dementia friendly activity and something called Love to Move, which is linked to the British Gymnastics, so that's seated exercise to movement, um, and that's going to take place in community venues, so actually outside of our centres, and that's something we're looking to do over the next year as well, is to deliver more in a community setting, as we understand coming to the gym with no prior knowledge or no prior connections can be quite daunting. Um, our area of swim school lead is going to continue to look at increasing opportunities for people from diverse communities to learn to swim, especially leading up to the summer holidays. And then the final bit from me is a bit of a, a plug, I suppose, um, but our GLL Sport Foundation, we have applications opening for this again on the 20th of December this year. So if there is anyone with links to clubs or individuals who they would like to nominate, then you can do so on our website. Um, we will share information on how to do this with the council as well, and hopefully it'll go out on social media. But we're really hoping to support a good number of local talented athletes and, and help them on their pathway to success. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very informative. Councillor Barnett Ward. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you for the presentation. And I hope that's demonstrated to the committee how the headline at the moment, of course, is the new facilities we're building, the new pools that we're opening, and we're opening a pool very, very soon. Just this week, I was over at Palmer Park with some children from Alfred Sutton Primary School. So we started to fill the swimming pool with a hose. I still, we, I don't know what we expected you to fill it with, but it is a hose. Uh, it's like your paddling pool at home, but so much bigger. Um, but as you can see, it's not just about the new facilities, fantastic and exciting as they are. It's also about making sure that the offer is for everyone in our community. Uh, Medway is looking fantastic. Now the gym there is amazing. And it was really lovely. I visited and spoke to some people doing a seated aerobics in the new studio and they absolutely loved it. Um, they really appreciate the investment that's happening there. South Reading as well and you can see all the work that is happening to make sure that everyone has the opportunity and is encouraged and welcomed into our leisure centres. These are council run leisure centres, we want them to be for everyone, we want to achieve the aims of our corporate plan, our aims on social inclusion through our leisure centres. We do through everything that we do and hopefully the presentation has given everyone a glimpse of that. And uh, yes, we can look forward to some Christmas swims. I think I'm going to try and get there over the Christmas holidays in Palmer Park and Rivermead next year. But that's not when the work starts. The work has already started and we're already delivering. So thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm impressed with what's happening at the, the pools. I'm impressed also to see that the food vending machines at Meadway have not in fact moved for probably about 30 years because I used to go to school there um, and they're in the exact same position. Um, I have a question from Councillor Dennis. Uh, um, it's not a question, just a comment really. Uh, first of all, that the, um, the presentation was very informative. I mean, it's, it's very comprehensive 
and uh, it just shows the commitment that this council has to health and well-being. Um, I just also want to uh, comment on the work done to secure the £1.5 million funding from the Sports England. Uh, I think this is very good work from our officers, uh, which will help to enhance the leisure facilities across the town. That's all from me. Thank you. I've got Councillor O'Connell. Thank you very much. And again, I'd like to echo that was really, really informative. And uh, I have to say a pleasure to see because it seems like you've got a really coherent sort of vision for where you're taking things forward, um, which is wonderful for the Reading residents. Um, bit of a technical question, really. Um, I was pleased to see about the solar panels on the new builds. Um, I did wonder how much what sort of percentage because i i know the leisure centers are terribly energy needy uh buildings and um, how much percentage are you hoping that those solar panels are going to sort of bring back um and also would there be any chance i understand right now there's a lot of pressures but in the future of looking to perhaps retrofit um the other sites i'm, I'm a ward councillor up in talha so meadway is very close to my heart um and it just feels like anything we can do to reduce our carbon footprint has got to be a good thing Thank you very much. Appreciate the question. Um, I would love to give you a percentage, but I'd be guessing. So I'll come back to you on that one, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, in, in terms of um, solar panels on the other two centres, South Brain actually have them in place already at the moment. Appreciate that's not your local, <laughs> local board, but um, um, Meadway is something that we are exploring at the moment. It's more a case of, uh, Meadway is an extremely old building. It's more a case of whether structurally the roof will be able to hold everything else. We are in the process of looking into that as well, though. But yeah, thank you very much. OK, I've got Councillor Rowland. Thank you. Just quickly, um, I want to thank you very much. And, and I'm so pleased in, in 2022 that pool is uh, ready to go. Uh, and uh, I think officers um, that that have worked uh, very diligently and certainly you all for for achieving uh, what what we promised um, on that. So that's that's wonderful. The the other thing that I wanted to actually commend and and point out and see if you all have any comments is is about accessibility. Um, I know that um, uh, with the um, uh, Access and Disabilities Working Group that that it began uh, a body of work that that we undertook and um, I was with uh, Ben Stainsby out there in the audience. Uh, as we went went through uh, Palmer Park to look at the ways that we could ensure accessibility from the highway, from the, the main roadway uh, to to the Palmer Park site. And um, I, I'm really I'm really, really delighted with that. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but but accessibility is just so extremely uh, important to us. I mean, it was brought up earlier this evening. Uh, and it's the heart of heart of everything we do. So uh, thank you for all the work you've been doing. And if you have any points on that, I'd be happy to hear. Uh, thanks very much again for the comments. Really appreciate it. Um, there is one other point that I didn't really touch on, actually, unfortunately. Um, both swimming pools are going to have both Meadway. Oh God, sorry, I keep doing it. Uh, both Rivermead and Palmer Park will have pool pods, which actually help um, People have struggled to access the pools, just give them a little bit easier access into the pool. It's a little bit more dignified than the um, old school pool hoists as well that we used to see that go into the pools as well. So it's, yeah, it again, just supports of access into facilities. Lovely, thank you. Councillor McCann. Thank you. Just a really quick one. I was really pleased to hear about the discounts that you're offering and that I have heard about the continuity of the your Reading passport scheme and sort of how that's mutating. But is that going to be ongoing or is there a deadline? So I believe there is a deadline to, to the first element of it. Thank you for the question. Um, it, within the within the contract, there is a there is a deadline. There is an agreement. There is a, a, a three year um, date. I think what we need to do is when we get closer to that period of time, actually assess where we are, and um, and then obviously speak to uh, officers and um, and relevant people. But yeah, there is unfortunately a deadline. 
Thank you. It sounds like there's a hope that it may may be um, <laughs> possibly extended. <laughs> I won't hold us to it. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> um, I think what's important to note as well is um, it is quite difficult. We, although we don't offer new people into the your running passport scheme, and um, what we do have is we've got resident cards in place as well. The standard residence card is, which is open for everybody who obviously lives within the, the Renan Borough. Um, that offers up to 30% discounts. We do offer a concessionary one as well, which Steph touched on, but that does actually give up to 50% discounts. Once we start looking into things like cost of swimming as well, it's obviously a fine balancing game to try and play as well, particularly with the energy crisis at the moment and pools and everything else. So we will do everything we can to support local residents, obviously, naturally. But yeah, I think the other conversations will come later on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, doorstep. The resident cards, is there an, do you have to pay to sign up for it? Thank you. No, just to clarify, absolutely free. There was originally a charge, interestingly, when we first started, there was a charge on the concessionary one. Um, so the standard residence card was free, but the concessionary one, there was a small annual charge. We've removed that because it doesn't really make sense. <laughs> Thank you. You are forgiven. Um, I have a question from the chair. So I am a Rivermead user. So my son goes there for swim school. I go there for aerobics and yoga. And thank you for the, the steps for creaky knees to get into the pool. Um, my question is, and I know lots of people have asked these over the years, is what's going to happen with the car park, which currently resembles the Lake District? <laughs> thank you for the question. So, um, <laughs> Although I'm only semi-new into the role I started uh, back in Reading at the start of the year, I am a res Reading resident myself, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, there is extensive works that's going to be taking place. My understanding is, and I'll double check and I'll come back and clarify this, um, so I'm hoping I'm not misleading too much, so that's not an intention. Um, there is going to be drainage works that take place. The car park's obviously all going to be relayed once it's all demolished. It needs to make sure both the drainage works correctly, because it obviously doesn't at the moment, and also that the falls are correct as well. Because again, at the moment, it's wavy at best. Yeah, no, thank you. Appreciate your comments. It'll definitely be taken yeah, into sure, consideration. We'll, sure, we'll be very pleased when we have to dodge around the puddles going forward. But I am very impressed at the speed that the, the leisure centre is going up. I'm looking forward to using it because it's just around the corner from where, where I live in my ward. Um, I haven't seen any more questions. So I'm going to thank you very much for coming and we look forward to the next update and we'll have even more open leisure centres. So thank you. Right, we're now moving on to agenda item. Um, oh, where is it gone? Eight, which is the winter service plan. So welcome, um, Sam Sheen. I'm going to say this up front. This is not the opportunity for world work. This is not the opportunity for asking for grit bins in your local area. I have sat through many of these winter updates and I know this gets asked every year. So I thought I'd make that clear at the very beginning. That's not what it's for. Um, and there's the information you need if you do would like to put a request in for a grip bin in the presentation. So I will not be taking questions about grip bins in particular roads. You're not doing a presentation. You're just doing the introduction. OK, go ahead. I love your presentations. They're my favourites, but go ahead with the introduction. There's no presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Just to confirm, there's no presentation. But I'll be more than happy next time. <laughs> All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Chair. Um, the report before you tonight is the Winter Service Plan 2022-23. Um, this is an annual report which I bring to uh, committee uh, to sign off and approve our programme for the coming winter. Um, the report also provides an update on how we managed last year's um, research, winter maintenance uh, contract and the review we carried out uh, to prepare this year's uh, winter service plan. Uh, in summary for the 21-22 winter season, as you remember, it was mild. Uh, there were short spells of colder weather, um, although we did, did result in 54 primary um, gritting routes being undertaken with no secondary. Secondaries are usually those that we uh, would keep when we have extreme harsh weather when we get snow. We didn't have any of that last year. Um, the, the winter service plan last year proved to be, as, as the years before, a robust service 
for the full duration of the winter service period. There was a minimal disruption to the primary secondary routes road network, and we had no issues with uh, delivery of uh, salt and grit materials. Uh, we've done the review for uh, this coming year um, of last year, and the grip runs of 47 remain the same. Uh, 900 tonnes of salt has proved to be more than sufficient for us the last uh, several years, so that remains in place. And we, we've done another review of the Appendix A to the Code of Practice, confirm that our gritting um, rates that we use are acceptable and manageable for us. Um, the, the only small change we've had, the gritting routes are the same. The small change is that we've agreed with our contractor that we're going to reduce the number of routes, which we normally had four, down to three. And the reason we've done this is to save money. And plus, they can still deliver the three gritting routes within the three hour window they have to provided for. So it saves us some money on the contract, but also delivers what we need it to deliver. Uh, the, the full winter service plan is attached as appendix one and asks us that this committee approve the recommendation set out in section two. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have got indications from, um, oh God, Jacopo, I've forgotten your surname, Danzoni. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Thank you, Mr. Sheen. Um, just want to make a comment on the question. First of all, great to see um, this plan. And one thing that I really appreciate, especially as a, a new councillor, is actually being able to see the process with which uh, we arrived to this plan. And therefore, every councillor is able to give information to the resident. One question I wanted to ask is around uh, cycling and cycle routes. I read that the council does not precautionary greet or salt share food ways and remote cycle ways when frost, ice and or prolonged hazardous condition are forecast with the exception of shared uh, routes on the primary and secondary um, salting nectar. So keeping our target to cut carbon footprint to net zero by 2030, one question I have is what could we, what can Redinborough Council do in the future so that we can facilitate our resident to keep cycling instead of driving during the winter period? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. It's a, it's a very relevant question, absolutely. I think um, the legislation is pretty clear. We have to provide what is reasonable, reasonably practicable. And basically that means um, we need to provide a service that is robust and safe and what we can actually manage to do. So if I can explain what the biggest problem we have with winter maintenance. Um, if we knew that we had um, freezing weather from seven o'clock every evening, every single night, and the rain wouldn't affect it, we could go out and, and, and grit every single footpath. But it's a hugely resource intensive um, 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 uh, um, piece of work to do. And let me explain why. So you'll have a truck with full of salt driving down the centre of our road and on each footpath will be two individuals pushing a hand spreader that has to be loaded by hand. So you have four individuals working uh, to do it. So we've got uh, 400 kilometres of road, cycling routes uh, are probably in excess of over 100 kilometres. It is a mammoth task. We'll use all our workforce. The problem you've got with when they grit is that they've got to look at the radar surveys for weather and rain. We can't grit uh, every day at say two o'clock before the staff go home. It could be three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. Sometimes it could be at midnight. It changes continually. Uh, and that is probably the main reason why we get very few contractors apply for winter service because their staff can't work the next day once they've gritted because of the working directives. So it'd be massively resource intensive. It's it's not reasonably practicable. Um, and we would have to have an army of staff throughout the winter just shoveling grit onto the road. And every time it rains, go back out and start in again. So it's 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 unreasonable. So what we do is we encourage cyclists to prepare for it. We're not discouraging cyclists, but people need to prepare for it. You would have your tires that can run on ice so you'll they'll have the more knobbly and, 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 and winter tires and you would also dress appropriately. The same as I'm in my um, suit today but I would never walk with my shoes because I will slip all over the show. You would have appropriate shoes during ice conditions. So um, in, in an ideal world we will grit everything at any given time but it's just not practical. There may well be solutions of materials uh, that could uh, be easier to spread, but we're not in that phase just yet. So it's again back to being prepared, 
and making sure that you dress appropriately for this season. And I would wish I could uh, grit everything, but it's just not practicable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Boland. Thank you, Chair. And um, I'm, I'm glad that Councillor Lanzoni was able to um, ask that question because, um, you know, this, this is a service that is run uh, extremely well, extremely efficiently. We, we get the job done um, um, every single year. And obviously, I think, you know, as, as we're all in a tra trajectory of, of uh, wanting more active travel, wanting to, to provide that accessibility for better active travel, I know that that's something that, that once we're not in the financial situation that we are, that we, that we will look um, as a council to to uh, drive that forward and cre increase those opportunities. But you lay out very well uh, in uh, on item seven and page fifty one uh, exactly what how we work with our our cyclists and and those situations. So, a couple a couple of points uh, I would commend to. Uh, those of you that may not have been around the block your first year as a counselor here or whatever, if you don't have it printed out, but you you do need to grab hold of this because pages 37, 30, uh, yes, 37 to 83 are everything you're going to need to manage your winter season in your ward. Uh, as Councillor Hacker said, we are not taking word work this evening, but you can answer a large percentage of your questions just by holding on to this handy dandy leaflet. Um, it, it is explained very, very well, and um, Sam, you do an excellent job. And and I, I'm I'm going to now embarrass you, and I'm going to I'm going to tell everyone in the public uh, sector here that um, Sam, amongst any off many officers that we have at the council, um, won a really impressive award this year. Uh, it's the Best of Britain award uh, for the um, for an outstanding. Uh, individual in the public sector that's gone above and beyond to engage with local community, improve local services and change local perceptions. And it was uh, given by the um, the Elkrig uh, organization, which is the, the kind of the superpower that, that Sam reports into and gets inspired by and everything else. And he goes away to these conventions and he comes back and he's all fired up. And Sam, you're always coming up with a new thing. I knew you were going to turn beet red, but I had to get it out there publicly. I mean, leave your leave your winter streets to Sam uh, because you, you, you and your team do a really, really wonderful job. And... Uh, Again, thorough report. Uh, I commend it to colleagues uh, and uh, our recommended actions here to approve this for uh, this upcoming year. And do please hold on to this handy dandy leaflet. And thank you again, Sam. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cresswell. Thank you, Chair. And thanks for the report. It's very comprehensive. Um, Following from Councillor Lanzoni's question, but maybe focusing on pedestrians briefly, if we can, um, is there any special consideration made for metal construction bridges? So there are a few around the borough, um, and they do freeze much more quickly than than a concrete surface or concrete on ground. Uh, thank you, Councillor. It's, it's already. Um relevant question and and, and and a problem that we are grappling with. So yes, anything that's new, we'll learn from experience. For example, we've um, gone with um, a lightweight solution on Reading Bridge when that was refurbished about seven or eight years ago. But we do find that um, we got we do have issues with that and we're looking at insulation uh, <coughs> into the trough below it to try and reduce that thing. So you're absolutely right. It's any new bridge we're going forward with doing that. Um, I mean, uh, one thing I, I haven't added, but it is in the report, is that we have a snow plan as well so that when we have adverse conditions when we have snow, we do send the snow plows out to clear bridges. So the Reading Bridge, Caversham Bridge, all the main ones, including uh, Christchurch Bridge, a footbridge will be cleared of snow around the hospitals, etc. We have a comprehensive plan and, and that's when we have lots of staff that can't go out and do their normal job, the, the uh, refuge collectors, and we do send them out en masse to um, clear those. So we do have a snow plan uh, to encourage so we can keep pedestrians moving, uh, but you're absolutely right with the material. So um, going forward, Reading Bridge was a learning curve for us. It was a brand new product. It was highly um, recommended because it was extremely strong and light. It can take vehicle traffic. We don't have to put bollards and that to keep it uh, vehicles off there. But it does have a slight problem uh, that it retains a bit of moisture, which makes it slippery. And it is it is a, is a problem we're trying to resolve. 
Thank you. Who knew? I uh, haven't seen any more questions, so we can agree the recommended action is then on page 29. Read. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, fascinating um, report. But yes, do keep hold of that information because it is comprehensive. OK, we now move on to agenda item nine, which is the local authority new build programme phase four spend approval. Uh, Miss Tapless, Sarah Tapless, are you there? I can't see on the screen. Right. No, I'm, I'm here on the screen. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, this report follows on from a July 2021 H&L report uh, that provided initial spend approval for the feasibility review of sites uh, in phase four of the local authority new build programme. This uh, report requests spend approval for a further 29.6 million to progress the construction of the new council homes across the 10 sites listed in paragraph 4.8 of the report once the designs have been finalised and planning permission has been obtained. The report also requests that committee delegates authority to the Assistant Director of Housing and Communities in consultation with those listed in paragraph 2.3 of the report to agree the details and specific funding arrangements for each of the sites referenced above. Thank you. Thank you very much. Camp Councillor Emerson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. You'll know this is quite a straightforward report that tracks and we're just now into the kind of what's been going on with the programme, what's proposed. And in this case, we are looking to approve spend this evening so we can get on with the good work. I think it's really important that it tracks this to committees to be showcased. Um, we've got a real mix of things going on, large developments, infill sites, mixed use sites like the adult social care stuff that's upcoming. And it's also important that we showcase the success we secure via planning committee. And I know the strategic housing service manager and planning and officers across the council do a lot to make sure we secure as much affordable housing as possible, whether that's via planning or building our own. So always proud of the team as we're proud of Sam and his award. Um, so thank you to um, the teams. And yeah, um, I hope that the committee is minded to grant approval. Thank you. I've got Councillor Dennis. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to commend the housing team for a report which shows the council's commitment to building high quality uh, council housing. Um, I can say that the uh, the new housing in my ward, Kentwood, on Lindhurst Road is a testament to the creative use of underused space to provide high quality housing. Uh, can I go on to say how the housing team are installing high quality insulation, triple glazing and heat pumps in older council housing stock in my ward also. Uh, this shows how the council is building houses for residents and modernising older, older properties, saving tenants money on fuel bills, also helping the council's net zero commitments. I also want to just have a little, I've got a little bugbear about the right to buy receipts. Um, you know, uh, we desperately need new homes in the country, so it frustrates me when, <laughs> when um, as, as, as to why this government ties up the um, right to buy receipts in so much red tape. Why can't those councils who are able to build use 100% of the right to buy receipts to build new houses for rent? Thank you. Thanks to Councillor Dennis. It's interesting, isn't it? We have a government that constantly goes on about removing red tape when it comes to, I don't know, health and safety legislation, etc. But when it comes to building people homes that I can afford and are decent to live in, it suddenly becomes extraordinarily complicated. It really is um, baffling, but not really when you think about who builds the houses and who profits from them. Um, Councillor Cresswell. Thank you, Chair. Um, just briefly on, on that, I think maybe we could suggest that the uh, right to buy one for one scheme is renamed the right to buy two for five. But um, my, my question relates to um, the size of the dwellings that we're building. And um, I know lots of thought would have gone into this, but we we have a clear need for, as, as well as the one and two bedroom dwellings, three and four bedroom dwellings, we have lots of residents who are struggling to keep their families in small dwellings. So if you could tell us a bit about how we decide um, how large the dwellings we should build. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, who wants to answer that question? Sarah, and then we'll come back to you, Councillor Emerson. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, 
as, as the as has been outlined, we do have a need for large family sized homes. So uh, as with all of our sites, we try to start with a position to see, uh, you know, whether or not they're suitable for family sized homes. We recognise that the council has a responsibility to try and deliver these to meet to meet the needs. Unfortunately, as I'm sure you can see on some of the sites that we've delivered so far, um, not all sites lend itself to houses. Uh, sometimes we are looking more towards um, flats uh, and they can often meet a specialist need uh, specific to either people looking to downsize or for those that need adaptations. We all also do have high numbers of people on the register that do need uh, one and two bed properties. So really, if, um, if in truth, we, we look at each site on a, on a site by site, site basis based on what would best uh, meet the local area, both meets the needs considering its location. And then obviously it goes through the planning process like any other site in the town where um, this is reviewed and uh, improved by the planning officers. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm afraid it is a little bit site by site. Thank that you. That's okay. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you want to come back? Yeah, just to add, because obviously the officer can't be political. I think, you know, the the right to buy um, stuff does not help in this situation, because I can <coughs> think from um, my understanding, it's a lot of the family homes that are generally sold by a right to buy in the, in the past. So that obviously doesn't help keeping that larger stock where we've built whole estates and on the basis that's for families and then a lot of those are, you know, no longer our stock. So that is an issue. I think as well, um, I can talk to experience with Wensley Road, which is in my own ward. We've got a lot of family homes going in on Wensley Road, but we've also got the tower block. So the plan is that those that are overcrowded will go into the homes or vice versa. So there's a lot of people that keep on to their free beds even though it's just an older lady for example but um her family have gone and it's the home she has loved and wants to keep so but they you know they see a new build right next door in the same area and there's a lot of work that the housing team do in that kind of holistic approach towards looking at the strategy but um your concerns are noted and definitely minded in the team that like they do uh, very much think of those and looking at the whole position and the environment we're in. Thank you, Councillor Emerson. I haven't seen any more notifications. So can we approve then the uh, 29.6 million spend on um, proper council housing in Reading on um, page number 87? Are we happy with that? Yeah. Thank you. OK, on to agenda item 10 which is once again back into to housing and homes. So this is the sustainable warmth funding. Who is introducing? Oh, there you are, Zola. You are. Welcome. Good evening, Good evening Chair. Good evening, members. Um, this report sets out the approach the Council is taking to utilise sustainable warmth funding. It details the Council's successful application for sustainable warmth funding as part of a consortium bid of 66 local authorities to the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. A total of 1.7 million has been allocated to enable low income households living within the private sector in Reading to tackle fuel poverty by improving the energy efficiency of their homes. Eligibility requirements are for the home to be of a EPC of have an EPC of D or below and its residents to have an annual income of less than £30,000 or under £20,000 after rental mortgage costs or beyond certain means tested benefits. Greater South East Energy Hub uh, have been approved uh, to manage the scheme overall across the 66 local authority areas and City Energy have been appointed to carry out the retrofit works in Reading. Officers uh, began promotion of the scheme last month, uh, utilising a number of different communication methods, uh, including direct targeting of individuals where we, where we recognise that we have the data to show that they could benefit from this scheme. As of last week, 100 applications have been received uh, and 17 homes have work underway. The Council has already successfully delivered a similar scheme with a previous round of funding of 250k, which enabled us to improve the energy efficiency of 28 homes in the borough with the installation of 40 improvement measures. Members are asked to endorse the approach the Council is taking to access funding and improve the energy efficiency of low income households within the private sector in Reading. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Councillor Emerson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Obviously, really good news. We know the government has choose to take a kind of piecemeal approach to 
sorting out the fact that we've got the oldest and leakiest homes in Europe. So it is quite inherently frustrating that there's various pots for various things, but it's still good the pot is there and that we've been successful. And I'm really grateful to the team for being proactive in reaching out to residents, putting it out um, on social media, press releases, um, magazines, making sure it's not you know, inaccessible for those that may not see it on social media. So there's been real thought about how we can make best use of this money for our residents. Um, I say that as if we're doing it, you have noted in the report, it's not something we're doing, but we're doing a lot to make sure people know about its existence. So yeah, really pleased with this. Um, and I hope committee are happy with it too and minded to approve. Thank you, Councillor Creswell. Thank you, Chair. Um, it is indeed very, very welcome funding. Um, I notice in the structure of the funding that there is a, a difference between owner occupiers and renters and that in rent for rented properties, the landlord will have to contribute a third of the cost. Um, I'm guessing that's not a structure that we have anything to do with that's, that's been imposed. Um, but it it is there's a danger there, I think, that our most vulnerable people in the private sector um, will be at the mercy of their landlords wanting or not wanting to put money into their houses. And I wonder if we are, or if we're aware of any work going on um, directly directed at the landlords in this scheme. I'm just going to answer that, Chair. Yeah, sure. Um, so we are targeting landlords as well. So we launched this scheme, our, our landlords uh, information evening, which we hold every year, um, where we engage with landlords across the borough and we give them information and advice on how to manage their properties. Um, there is new legislation coming for uh, private sector landlords, which means that they will also be required to have a, a decent home standard, which improves energy efficiency. Um, and so as part of our approach is to target landlords who know they're going to have to do the work eventually. And this is a way of um, helping them to deliver that work at cheaper cost than it would be. So, yes, they have to um, they have to contribute a third. Um, but if they don't take this scheme up, then they will have to pay the 100 percent themselves. So um, we're doing everything that we can to make sure that landlords are aware of it. And we had have had a number of landlords who were inquiring uh, about the funding and a number of those landlords are portfolio landlords so they have a quite a significant number of properties within the borough so we're working with them to see how we can make that work for them. Thank you, is that okay? Councillor Emerson? Yeah just add to the politics again because obviously Assistant Director of Housing can't uh, you know um, she mentioned the energy performance certificate stuff and whilst that is due to come in um, the government are still flip-flopping on it so you know I would just take the opportunity to um, perhaps ask Councillor Singh to raise it with national government because you know we spoke a bit about regulation earlier and it's inherently frustrating because both tenants and landlords aren't happy with regulation um, because landlords think it's going too far or it's not clear and of course we have some really good landlords like we had the landlords even that Zelda mentioned and that was really positive and they engage with us and come through our rent guarantee scheme which is really positive but then tenants don't always get that high quality housing that they deserve in the town and you know we're taking um, the approach in terms of both sides and you know, a lot of these piecemeal approaches to the funding in terms of retrofitting homes are means tested, but just random stuff. So like the landlord thing is, you know, not yet seen that, I don't think, in a grant. So um, it makes sense. I appreciate it from the government side of thinking, but um, it just throws curveballs in. And, you know, each one is different in terms of household income or what level the EPC is. So for me, I would, you know, really appreciate <coughs> the government being more clear on these things. And I think that would help. But um, I think Zelda did reassure you more generally. But I just wanted to add my thoughts. Thank you. It's a very flip floppy government at the moment, isn't it? It's, it's like they're treating politics like a failing football team. Who's going to be the next leader? We never know and how long it will take. Um, I haven't seen any more notifications. And so can we please approve the recommended action then on page 98? Yeah, lovely. Right. OK, the, we are now on to item 11 and I'd like to welcome the um, Reading Festival team. 
to Housing Neighbourhoods and Leisure this year, slightly earlier than last year. And I'd also like to thank uh, the Managing Director of Festival Republic, Melvin Ben, for being here this evening as well. So welcome. We're going to have um, a presentation from Festival Republic. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, and then we will have the opportunity to ask some questions because obviously scrutiny is, is what we're here for and why we're elected. Yes, uh, Mr Crosby. Chair, um, I'll just give a very brief introduction whilst everybody's sort of settling down. Um, so as you mentioned, Festival Republic are here this evening to provide us with uh, an overview of uh, the 22, um, 2022 event um, to give us a bit of their debrief feedback. Um, it also to uh, respond to some of the questions that they received in advance, uh, which were really helpful. Thank you, councillors, for providing those. A very quick introduction from left to right. Uh, so uh, Melvin Bent, Managing Director for Festival Republic. Charlotte Oliver, who's a licensing coordinator with Festival Republic. Uh, Victoria Chapman, who's the sustainability lead. Um, for those who were there last year, she uh, uh, gave an excellent presentation. And then Noel Painting, who is our is, your, is, is kind of the, the silver, um, so the, one of the key people on site at fest, uh, during the festival who orchestrates a lot of the activity down there and will be able to give you that sort of real view of what was happening at the time. Thank you, Chair. Oops. Thank you very much. So um, as you've probably just noticed, if you would like to speak, you have to press the button. When the lights are on, it's your turn. So over to you. OK, um, I'll start. Um, who, who's changing the slides? Just some. Um, thank you. Um, so first of all, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk to you again about the festival. Um, it's really nice to be so welcomed. We always find Reading Borough Council uh, very supportive um, and we actually really like enjoy you having you as our licensing local authority. Um, and also because you have excellent staff that we really like as well. Sorry, James, there's a bit of a plug there. Um, the um, festival in 2022, so if you could switch to the next slide, please. Um, really successful festival. Um, so a few differences uh, just in terms of timing. Um, those of you who are sort of regular festival followers will know we open the campsites on a Wednesday. Uh, slight difference this year, we advertise six o'clock, um, but people tend to come early. Um, and this year we open the campsites at 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, what that meant was a much smoother flow on the Wednesday of the early bird ticket holders, um, uh, which then helps us with Thursday, which is our busiest day of arrival. Um, it sort of eases traffic and it, it's very busy, but basically it helps us spread the load in terms of pedestrian movement and vehicle movement. Um, Thursday, the general admission tickets uh, were let in at eight o'clock. Um, we then, the arena, we've got a separate arena for many of you will have been, but we've got a separate arena from the campsites, which is uh, secured. So people are only allowed in at certain times. Um, we have a late night arena opening, which is a soft opening with a small part of the arena and fairly low level entertainment, but that opened at five o'clock. And then we have the, uh, the main days of activity uh, and entertainment. So Dave, the Arctic Monkeys in the 1975 were the headliners. Uh, we opened the camps, we opened the arena, sorry, at 11 o'clock each day uh, or pretty close to 11 o'clock each day. Um, and they were the headliners, which finished around about 11.20, I think pretty much every day. Um, and then on Sunday night, so, so our really keen campers are actually there Wednesday through, uh, through Sunday. So. I think that makes five nights under canvas in Reading. Um, and the campsite closes with an advertised close at 12, but we realised not everybody wakes up very early, having possibly partied late into the night. So we let people um, stay until two o'clock and we close the campsite at two. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, that's just the poster, really. Obviously, really good lineup. Um, and again, um, we had uh, a main stage west and main stage east. Um, so two big stages, which enables us to attract people like Bring Me the Horizon or Halsey uh, or Megan the Stallion to headline uh, our main stage West. And then we alternate effectively between the two main stages. And although we can't read it here, a really good supporting lineup of acts on all the other stages. Next, please. Uh, so in summary, um, really successful event uh, for us. Um, brilliant coverage regarding the artist, really good coverage on TV. 
uh, we made a number of uh, changes prior to the event. Um, as you will know, probably having dealt with it in this committee, uh, that we've got a new Rivermead Centre being built. Um, what that did was take away quite a lot of what we've used for uh, parking, um, coach drop off and various other things. Um, so we made alternative arrangements. We opened up what we call Orange Gate, which is uh, leads us into Wigmore Road, uh, Wigmore Lane, sorry. Um, so we opened that up for egress and ingress um, and that really helped. And we found alternative places to put vehicles basically and people, all of which were really successful. It was a challenge, but it, it sort of worked. Um, the other thing we did, and it's sort of there's lots of highlights, was Ask Angela. You may be familiar with the Ask Angela campaign, but basically for people who were feeling uh, vulnerable, um, all the bar staff, and we did various checks on this, all the security, all the bar staff were aware of Ask Angela if they were feeling vulnerable. And there was a really good response rate when we did tests, like a bit like when we do for alcohol test purchases, we did test Ask Angela's to see what the response was from staff, and they were all totally aware of what it was and how they needed to deal with that situation. Um, and uh, looking forward to 2023, and there are two parts to this presentation, which James alluded to earlier. Um, we're going to introduce Challenge 25 across all bars, um, and uh, we're going to extend the Eco campsite. Next slide, please. Um, two key areas of focus, really, in terms of uh, this presentation. Um, the first is safeguarding, next, and, and the second will be sustainability. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of safeguarding, next slide. I'm um, sorry, I should, I should have done, don't go back, but there's some pictures of the safe hubs there. So we've got a, um, we have a safeguarding coordinator um, in 2022, and we've got all these partners um, who help and work with us. Uh, TLC welfare, medics, uh, site crew, uh, welfare crew in the hubs. Um, we've got Brook music support. I won't read through all of them, well, I nearly have read through all of them, but all of those people, um, report into the safeguarding coordinator and then we have regular meetings with the safeguarding coordinator. Also part of that group are Thames Valley Police, South Central Ambulance, Bright of Futures and RBC. Um, and we've sort of developed this over the last probably since 2019, maybe 2018, where in the camp sites we've got hubs that people can go to if they're feeling vulnerable and safe worried. Um, extending what we had previously, which was a set of perhaps less joined up facilities from Samaritans, from street pastors, from welfare and, and from festival medical. So it, it's a way of joining all those things up together to provide a, a sort of unified service. Next one, please. Um, and this was the uh, site map and you can see we've got safe hubs uh, throughout the campsite um, and we put medics into white. So basically wherever you are on the site, um, you've got facilities that you can access. We will talk in the second part of this, of the presentation, well, not presentation, the second session about how we're aiming to um, expand that and elaborate and provide an even better service. Um, this is the punter map or the punter friendly map. So this is available on the phone uh, via the app um, so that you know people can sort of use this. Um, so that's not our more detailed map for the site plan. Thank you. Next one, please. Um, and various campaigns um, about keeping hydrated. We obviously had a pretty hot festival largely, um, risks about mis me uh, mixing substances. Um, and what we did, we developed this um, with uh, Reading Borough Council, with Leeds City Council, which is our partner festival that happens at the same weekend, and with Thames Valley Police and Public Health in terms of looking at messaging. So we worked with seven schools in Berkshire to see what messaging worked, what they listened to, what they looked at and how, what the reaction was to that. Um, and a working group was, was established, which meets every two months and will continue to meet to, to look at how we can get this messaging out. There's a couple of examples of that messaging down below. And I think on the next slide, please, there is more messaging, which we put up on the big screens. So, um, oh, I can't read it from here. I think, uh, sorry, uh, you've got it here. Thank you very much. Yeah, don't feel pressure to do anything you don't want to do. If you don't feel great the morning after, take a break and remember to pace yourself. There were a whole series of messages which were very punter friendly, very punter oriented in terms of just looking after themselves and looking after their friends as well. Next slide, please. 
Um, and uh, again, social media, um, lots of things on social media, basically expanding that, saying the same thing. So different, same message basically, but going out in, in, in various ways. And you can see um, there was a campaign uh, about stopping violence against women, um, which we supported. Um, next slide, please. Which brings me to, if I can hand over to Vicky, who's our sustainability coordinator and is going to take us through the rest of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Noel, and thank you everyone for including sustainability as part of this. It's obviously a really important topic, getting more and more so important. Um, so next slide, please. Yeah, sure. So this is a reminder and sorry for those who are here in March, you've seen who've seen this before. This is an over, overview of our Green Nation Sustainability Charter, which Festival Republic have signed up to. Um, there's three core pillars, but we have eight areas of uh, work within our sustainability work. Um, public engagement and engagement generally with our fans, artists, employees and sponsors, and then also local community and the, everyone who comes to the festival and beyond. Um, the bottom left there is climate change and um, in that category we have en uh, energy emissions and transportation with an overarching goal to reduce our carbon emissions by 50% by 2030. And then the bottom right there is resource efficiency. So that's where we look at waste and plastic, water and food, um, all the, the things that we are using to create the festival um, to make sure that we are um, using within Earth's limited resources. Next slide, please. So under climate change, so each slide I have, uh, I've structured this in the way that we've got the Green Nation goals at the front, and then what we did at Reading Festival to, to um, implement those goals. So under climate change, emissions and energy, um, we used 100% HVO biofuel in all of the generators this year at Reading Festival. We've used a percentage previously, up to 30% in the past, but this year we use them in all of the generators. So just to explain that that is hydro-treated vegetable oil. It's um, generally made from used cooking oil and it is um, part of the um, Renewable Energy Directive as well. It's, it's covered, it complies with, with that. We specify that palm based vegetable oils are not to be used because sometimes it can be a byproduct of palm oil, but we made sure that that wasn't um, used at the festival. We also used 100% LED festoon and tower lights, and that has been the case for a few years now. And we had 20 battery generators that we used, and that was an increase from last year where 12 were on site. So the results were uh, 88 percent reduction in our scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions and that is the emissions that we are in direct control of the, the energy that we are generating ourselves at the festival um, and our total carbon emissions was 52 tonnes of CO2 equivalent compared to 2021 that's a yeah 88 reduction there and we um, have also compared this to a benchmark that is in uh, Judy's Bicycle, who are a, a, a charity that works to push climate action within the creative arts. And their benchmark is five litres of fuel per person per day. And Reading actually used four litres, no, sorry, 0.4 litres of fuel per person per day. And another benefit of the HVO biofuel, it does have reduced um, 50% less fine particulate matters as in air quality, 22% less nitrous oxide and 60% less carbon monoxide as well. So it does have other benefits as well as the carbon reductions. Next slide, please. So then under, under emissions still with transport, we do encourage low carbon forms of transport by um, in sending information out in advance to our audience. Um, such as the coach, um, train and shuttle buses that are available um, from the train station. We also have a priority car park for lift sharers who sign up via Go Car Share. We have a dedicated page for um, car sharers coming to Reading Festival and they park, they get free car parking for a start and it is also closer to the, the, main, the, the, the white entrance um, where the car park is generally. And then for everyone else who does drive, one pound of every single car parking ticket is donated to Trees for Cities, and that is ring fence for local projects in Reading for, for tree planting projects. And um, back of house, we also make sure that our contract to travel is, is reported and we tie that into the final payments as well. So we do make sure we get that 
information and that's part of our broader scope three emissions. So then on the right hand side we can see that um, the 20% of attendees travel by car, 18% were also car but pick up and drop off and then the remaining 62% travel by public transport which is train, mostly train and then shuttle buses on foot and then big green coach. Next slide please. So under resource efficiency is waste and plastic. Um, there's quite a lot on here, so I'll just go through the initiatives and this is um, similar to what I, I went through in March as well. So our tickets were paperless to reduce waste in the first instance. We have a three bin system across the site, which is divided into compostable, recyclable and non-recyclable. Non and we make sure those labels are actually items that are used at the festival, which you can see on the top right hand corner there. We've had a 10p deposit on all cups and bottles for a long time since 2007 and, and that encourages their return to create a clean stream of recyclable material. We have waste guides that go out to all our traders, bars and sponsors, which is monitored and enforced throughout the event by the green team and, and my team. We use, um, we don't have any single use plastic serveware that's been banned since 2009 and we encourage reusable bottles in advance as well as part of our pre-coms and we do sell that in a merch stand with clearly signposted water refill points across the site and we also do have refillable soft drink units on site as well and they have a, a return um, scheme they're still in with paper cups but if you take your cup back you can get 50p off the drink you can't really see it very clearly there but it's yeah it's it's a, an offer that we put on next slide please so then in the campsites we have a strong um, take your tent home message Again, pre starts off with pre communications that we send out in advance. We've got a recommended packing list and um, to try and reduce the everything being brought to site, really kind of think about what you need to pack to come to the festival. And that includes a tent buying guide um, to to recommend to purchase a tent that's going to last you that you will reuse. We have a dedicated green team who um, encourage campers to get involved with our recycling initiatives, provide them with free recycling bags and make them aware to bring them back to recycling points. There's at least one, uh, if not two, in each campsite and they can get rewards if they come back and um, return their recycling. And so that could be tickets to next year, um, merchandise or we also ask our sponsors to get involved as well. So we had a hundred pound co-op voucher that could be won. Um, our take your tent home message is shared on the big screens, campsite signage, we've got rolling LED screens in the campsites, we've got the app, social media, which you can see there, the take, say no to single use, take your tent home, um, as well as the green team and the stewards on the ground. And then after the festival, we invite local community and charitable organisations to come and collect tents on the Monday to Wednesday, and that resulted in 2.9 tonnes of equipment and 4.4 tonnes of food salvaged this year that was sent for redistribution via fair share and other local groups as well. Next slide, please. A new initiative that we had this year, which I'm really proud of, is the eco campsite. So this is we have had an eco campsite at download for a few years now, and Isle of Wight Festival also had an eco campsite for a while. And um, we introduced it this year as a waste reduction, but also an engagement initiative. So we collaborated with Music Declares Emergency, who are a, a music industry environmental um, campaign group to launch the first ever eco campsite. So it was 100,000, 100,000, 1,000 capacity. I wish it was 100,000 capacity, but not quite yet. <laughs> um, 100, yeah, 1,000 festival goers camped um, in the eco campsite. And we had, we developed our own ethos. So if there were three core um, principles to sign up to stay in the eco campsite. The first one was to respect your fellow campers, be inclusive and talk about uh, what's important to you and enjoy the festival together. The second one was respect your environment, avoiding littering, using the facilities that are provided at the festival and don't cause any excess waste. And then the last principle was to leave the campsite exactly as you found it. Um, so we actually physically got people to sign up to the pledge as they arrived. They were all welcomed individually in the, the groups by the um, info hub that we had there with a really dedicated team who were yeah, really, really pleased to be part of the first EHA campsite. And then we provided facilities. We had compost toilets, daily yoga sessions that were really popular. And we also gave out recycling bags and with a dedicated recycling point as we do in other campsites. 
Next slide, please. So this is the before and after picture of the eco campsite. It was left absolutely pristine and we had some really, really good feedback from the customers who stayed there. Um, the main things that were coming through was the sense of community that they felt when they were in the eco campsite. It wasn't just about being eco and green. It was about connecting with others and wanting that kind of community spirit to, to last um, even further than the festival. So this year, well, sorry, next year, we're going to extend it to 2000 capacity, at least depending on uptake. But we did, it did sell out really quickly uh, this year. So yeah, I'm quite positive that we will reach those numbers. Next slide, please. So then the results of all the, the waste reduction resource efficiency work that we've been doing, um, none of Reading Festival's waste went to landfill, and that has been the case for an, um, a number of years now. All non-recyclable waste is sent to either solid recovered fuel, SRF, or refuse derived fuel, which is RDF, which creates energy. We reduced the total waste by 42 tonnes this year, which is 5% from 2021. And the local material recovery facility, which is literally just over the road from the festival, reported a 55% recycling rate during the period that the festival was on. So I made sure that they were just recording that period because the majority of the waste going into the site was from the festival. And that's compared to um, Reading Borough Council's publicly available information. I know at the last meeting, um, a, a different number was raised, so I would like to make sure that I am referring to the correct information there, but that's what I can find on the local government um, annual results tables. That's that's on gov.co.uk. And then lastly, we have done an aerial count from, from, the, from the aerial photos. We have done a tent count and it's estimated that 38% of tents were left behind. And last year we estimated that that went back up again to 59%. So that was a 35% decrease. So it does show that the, the campaigns and the information that we have had on site this year has made an impact. And then next slide, please. I will come on to them a little bit more as well. So. Another really big project we did this year, which we started last year on a smaller scale, was we measured the carbon footprint of the food sold at the festival. And we worked with the London School of Economics to actually do those carbon calculations. And then we presented that in a traffic light system. So red was the high carbon meals and then green was low carbon meals. So it was designed as a nudge to nudge people in the right, well, in, in the direction we want them to go in to um, help reduce the impact of food and understand their own kind of um, impact that they can have on decisions that they make. Next slide, please. So yeah, a bit more on public engagement. So this is our, our third pillar. So we worked with, oh, well, first of all, we published our own festival charter, which is detailed on the website and um, detailing how we are working towards our Green Nation goals, as well as equality and inclusion. We had a brand new headline collaboration with Music Declares Emergency, so it wasn't just the Eco Camp. Then we did actually co-create a really inspiring video that showed that was shown on the big screens um, to encourage people to what can actually come together, what can happen if we come together in the fight against climate change. And I do have that video if you would like to watch it. It's only like 30 seconds long if we've got time. Um, I'll continue on this slide and then and then I'll put it out there if you want to. And then the we also worked with a youth climate justice coalition who are the main youth climate justice activists in the country. So Fridays for Future, XR Youth, Teach the Future and Climate Live. They brought a, a bright pink double decker bus and had a weekend full of talks and live music to engage with their own peer group on this subject. And they also gave a talk on the alternative stage. And the next slide, please. So as part of the No Music on a Dead Planet campaign, festival goers shared photos of themselves with the hashtag on the chance with the chance to appear on the main stage big screens that was shown in between the acts like all weekend. Um, the hashtag was trending at number two on Twitter, which was um, yeah throughout the biggest weekend of live music with around 30,000 tweets raising huge awareness across the festival and on Twitter. 
It was featured on BBC broadcast as part of the lockup um, of Reading and Leeds Festival logo, which was at the beginning of the presentation. There were um, around a thousand fans became founding members of the Fan Club for Climate, which was a new initiative that Music Declares Emergency put together to bring uh, music fans together before gigs to connect on like climate change issues. And 10,000 people wore the No Music on a Dead Planet temporary tattoos. Music Declares also held a, media, a space in the media area and 21 artists participated in the campaign, taking small videos about um, what they were doing in the fight against climate change and putting that out on Instagram and, and socials. And then finally, yeah, the, the results of this campaign, thousands of young people engaged with, with the campaign and it positioned the UK live music as a major vehicle for driving climate change awareness. So that's... Um, Next slide, that, that's me done. But if you want to see the video, I would really love to share it with you if we have time. We haven't had much luck today uh, okay. with videos, but we can give it a crack. Ah, OK, let's try. So um, if you go back to slide 29, the one with the bus, that's it. Oh, that's it. And then that it's that second no music on a dead planet one. It's not that one, that one yet. Fingers crossed. I need more than just fingers. I think they might have to admit defeat. Oh, it's me twice, lovely. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. It was too much to ask of the computers. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, interesting presentation. I enjoyed listening to the music festival from my bedroom reading my book because I am that close and that old. So, um, I am going to ask Councillor Rowland, would you like to say a few words? Um, I would I would share and um, I would like to also uh, um, give others the opportunity to ask questions. So I will I will try to be brief. Um, firstly, uh, a thank you, Melvin, uh, for coming this evening along with your with your team and for uh, the symbiosis that we that we enjoy uh, with Reading Festival and that that relationship that we've had for many many years and um, certainly the the uh, economic boon that it gives our town the notoriety that it gives our town and all of those other things. Um, now comes the fun part, Melvin. Um, you know we don't we don't get better. We don't we don't. Uh, we don't advance without a little bit of scrutiny, and I know that I, I know that their the uh, festival was largely successful this year um, on on many levels, and I and I think thank uh, the team for the wonderful presentation. But there are a number of points that I know we want to drill down on, and I think it helps you all become better, and it helps us have that better relationship with you. So um, I I will um, actually just just start out. I know that others will certainly hit on the environmental issue. Uh, that is that's obviously something that that comes every year. The the stories of the tents and all of that, and so that's an inevitable question that we have to face. Uh, there were a lot of a lot of good um, positive actions that that we heard with the policing, with the uh, the fire watches, and all of that. Uh, those other kinds of things that went into in, into making it, um, you know, a safe festival. But it wasn't perfect. Uh, you know that there were issues on on the Sunday. Uh, that there were uh, a number of removals. Uh, Thank goodness the the res the the, the uh, attendees that were removed were this year successfully and carefully taken to 
ensure that they had proper transport home, unlike uh, as we understood last year. So there were improvements in that regard. Um, but I, I want to give you all an opportunity to um, uh, possibly also refute anything that were there were you know articles in the newspaper were there things that you felt unfair what was the what was the uh you know were there were there different angles to the story and uh how can we ultimately look at in in the future which i think um environment aside the the rougher story was that that sunday afternoon and some of the stories that came out of there how can we look at ensuring our 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 safety, our safety for women and all of those other issues, which I know, again, others will want to drill down on, is properly uh, attended to. And I'm going to zip it there because I want to give others opportunity, but thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rowland. I've got Councillor Dennis. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I did actually write in a, a, a few questions um, to um, Festival Republic. Um, but uh, there's a couple of things. But first of all, um, I was I was one of the council, along with the councillor Barnett Ward, who spent three days at the festival, and uh, on on three separate days, obviously, and saw the organisation and all of the, the backroom staff and all that kind of stuff. And it is a massive operation. Let me tell you, it's not, you know, it's not a straightforward little event. It's massive. Um, and it was quite impressive from that point of view. Um, the eco camp, that was something, and speaking to some of the camp dwellers, um, they really did enjoy that. I spoke to one, one of the gentlemen there who um, wasn't gonna come to Reading Festival this time. He's been to Reading Festival a few times, but he just didn't like the trashy nature of the camps and as he was an older reveler, he, you know, you know, he just wasn't up for it. But then when he heard about the eco camp, he said, right, let me give it a go. And he was absolutely bowled over by it and he was and he's coming back. So that, that's a, a plus for yourself. And and it was well managed by festival buddies who who uh, I've, obviously I've never heard of them before, but they're just a group of people that you know that, that do this sort of thing and they they were the ones that induced the the campers to sign up to the you know the three pledges um and they had and they were pub and that those pledges were signed and it was on a whiteboard their signature so everyone can see everyone's signature on that whiteboard i thought that was a good idea um one of the things that I was a little less uh, a little you know, less impressed with was the amount of um, plastic bottles that were left on. Uh, it was literally like a carpet of of plastic recyclable bottles in the in those campsites, which were not the eco ones, particularly the ones that were around the main arena area. Um, I, I suppose that they would all be collected and they will be recycled anyway. But it's just, you know, I, I don't know if there's if there is a way of fixing that. But um, that was one of my questions. Um, the other question was about the eco camps, and you've already answered that. that you're going to have an eco camp next time. That's that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dennis. Yeah, it was really good to spend that time with you on the on the Monday morning and, and walk around and, and show you kind of what the, the work that my team have, have been doing as well. Um, yet yeah, we're extending the eco campsite to 2000 capacity this uh, next year. Um, plastic bottles, I did have the plastic section. Um, all of our bottles sold at the festival are made from recycled content plastic bottles, so not virgin plastic. So that is a step um, kind of towards a better material that we're using. And we do have the recycling reward scheme to encourage people to bring that recycling back for the rewards. Um, so the more we can push that message out and, and bring kind of the recycling back to the recycling points, um, the better really. And, but the campsites, they are quite difficult to control 
because people can bring in their own stuff as well. And that's something that we have found like in the arena, we can control that area quite well. And we have the deposit return scheme as in like financial value on those bottles. So I think the majority of the bottles from the camp that the arena do stay in the arena. The ones in the campsite are, yeah, it is harder to control. And um, so that's why we have the other reward schemes of bringing things back for prizes. Um, but we can't really have the kind of cash situation in in the campsites um, so yeah the more we could do to try and encourage kind of other um, shops around in the local area whether there's something we could do there to to try and reduce the amount of plastic that's coming into the campsites um, so that's yeah that's something that we could look into Um, it'll come back to you. It comes. To, it happens to us all. I couldn't remember Jacopo's name surname earlier. It's fine. Um, yeah, the interesting question around plastic bottles. I mean, in, in Germany, in Dusseldorf, wonderful Dusseldorf, they obviously have the machines in supermarkets where you can return your plastic and you get a cash reward, which I think is very sensible. Mm. Um, but maybe we should think about how we can reduce plastic overall. But I suppose as a festival, what you don't want is these things coming in, which are solid metal. And um, yeah, if somebody started chucking them at people like Daphne and Celeste, like the old days, that wouldn't be very helpful, would it? Um, right, Councillor Singh. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, thank you for the presentation. And uh, the Reading Festival is uh, really important for our town as well. It adds colour and it's also really, really important for our local economy. So um, uh, thank you for, for that. And my question is, uh, in your presentation, you, you mentioned I've asked for Angela. It was really successful and you mentioned test. You know, you, you did a test and uh, was there any data like there was a number of reports which were handled and which was really helpful and assuring uh, around that. And my second question is around you also focusing on safeguarding and sustainability. So my question is on safeguarding. There was a number of reports of tent burnings and, you know, things getting thrown on other trends and uh, also other antisocial behavior activities. And one concern was coming, the security was really thin, especially at late nights. Uh, is that something taken on board? What actions have been taken? Thank you. Chair, I'm not sure how you want to do. do you, I, yeah. I mean, there's some of the things that I want to respond to in what will be the private session because it's about the change that we're looking. If at. you want to defer something to the private session, by all means, just let me know we'll, and we'll, we'll move that bit. So which which of those questions did you want to put into part two? Um, the, um, uh, the the last one around the um, safeguarding, uh, the, not the safeguarding so much the, the fires. And fires. The okay. So we'll just move that to part two, but if you could answer or somebody could answer and the other points. Most of Councillor Rowland's uh, as well. That's um, fine. Yeah. So the other question was around Ask Angela and those reports. Thank you for that. Oh, testing. <laughs> um, yes, Ask for Angela. We didn't actually measure the figures of that one, but we um, are security coordinators ourselves. Um, I think Catherine had gone out as well on the ground at some point. I think we had heard that we had spread the word from the moment that they entered in the perimeter gates coming in. Um, our team at that point was sort of saying, we're running this campaign. Our staff are aware of it and please ask for Angela at any point that you need to. But actual figures, we don't have them, I'm afraid. Um, but I'd like to think that from Catherine, your, your scenes of that and mine, myself and our security coordinators, we were making sure that we were speaking with security to ask them at any point, um, sort of testing, can you tell us what, say, the campaign is or what the process is if somebody was to flag it up? So hopefully that does answer your question. Thank you. Just to explain, because obviously there may be people watching around what part two means, what we're referring to. That is a closed section of the meeting that is um, put in place in case there's sort of sensitive and commercially sensitive information. So I just thought I'd explain that before we thought we were doing something tricky. Um, Councillor Lanzoni. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to commend the integrated effort of Festival Republic and Thames Valley Police and Ready Borough Council. Sorry, I'm trying to look there, but the mic is here, so I'm going to turn the mic. Um, to keep festival goers and residents uh, safe at and during the festival. Um, my councillor for Caversham Ward, north of the river, 
Um, and I must say that most of the feedback I've received following the um, festival were of uh, a surprisingly efficient and effective response from especially Thames Valley Police, I must first say, but there, there, there was a very good um, image of integration between us in dealing with anything around safety and community safety. And this has been mentioned uh, multiple times by um, many people which look after uh, these aspects in our um, in our society. Um, I, I think for everyone, you know, for residents, uh, it was very clear that all stakeholders worked together for community safety this year. Um, people had man noticed, you know, uh, the new technologies and strategies used by Thames Valley Police, which um, um, helped keeping everyone safe despite maybe a smaller number of agents on the field. Um, I heard about early interventions, uh, especially in the first uh, hours of the festival to uh, stop some um, worrying behaviors. And I just want really to um, start with commending, uh, I, I would say a first step, I'm not um, um, you know, I, I know it's not the first, but it's the first time that as a local representative, the, the, I will say the main feedback was positive and was around safety. Now, um, I think it highlights the, a very good direction. I hope um, you can do even more. I was very uh, pleased to see safeguarding as one of your uh, priorities, because um, I still think that potentially a festival like Reading Festival is still not a, a hugely safe place, and that there may be some um, very strong safeguarding risks, especially towards young women and I will say under 18 and accompanied by an adult. So, uh, you know, we saw your effort because I think we, we did see it. Uh, I think it came across extremely well for those outside the festival as a, as a um, paradox. Um, and we, I think the Redinburgh Council will be extremely um, keen to do anything to continue this work going forward to make sure we make the festival as safe as possible for people, you know, outside or inside. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lanzoni. Did you want to remark on any of those points at this bit? Conject? No? No? no. Um, yes, thank you for being so constructive about your comments, as well as um, to acknowledge that the work that we already do um, and to sort of ask us to continue. And that is exactly what we will do. I don't think at any point we will take that off of our focus at all. Um, from the moment, from the start of our SAG meetings to briefing our zone managers, to briefing our security, it's on everyone's focus. So there's always more we can do. Um, we'll go into that later, uh, how we're looking to do that within the campsites. But at any point, anyone's got any recommendations, we take all that on board. But Ask for Angela. We work with Safe Gigs for Women on site. I know that we need to be um, leading on that bull campaign, violence against women and girls. We have all of these things in our focuses and we will continue to. Thank you. Thank I've you. got then next Councillor Cresswell. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Very comprehensive. It's clear that you're making very considerable efforts on all fronts. Um, I have a, a quick well, I, I, I like the eco site um, principle of leave no trace. Obviously, that's the principle for any camping anywhere. Um, so one, one question is, um, do people pay extra to stay in the eco site or is it just a sign up? Thing? It's free. Yeah, it's just Great. a sign up. Um, the, the big elephant is obviously waste. And I think at one of your slides, you said that 42 tonnes 
of waste was about 5% of the total. So you've got somewhere near 850 tonnes of waste going off site. Um, and a lot of that was incinerated. Well, in some form, burn for energy, I think you said. Seven, I think I haven't got the, I'll get the figures, but we had 52, 53% was recycled. And then um, the composting rate, I need to get back to that slide actually, but the actual recovery rate was 17%. Yeah, so. The, recy the recycling was 55%. The composting was 12%, and then the recovered, um, the both the two divisions of the recovery was 19% and 13%. Okay. So uh, the majority of the waste has been recycled, the rest or composted, and the rest is is recovered, which is the energy from waste. Yeah. Okay. And the emissions from that process go into your calculations. Yeah, there are scope three wider emissions rather than our scope one and two emissions that's just the energy that we create on site but we do we do the calculations on our on our okay, waste so as well yeah do you have the figure for um, emissions per person including scope three no not at the moment not not with okay. me now and um, we're still making those calculations for the scope three because it is it is huge because it does cover our um our contractor travel as well Okay, oh, that that would seem to be the relevant measure which we should be using. No, it's definitely relevant. Um, it's just within our Green Nation Charter, we we've got our scope one and two emissions reduction target. So that's what, yeah, that's what I have been focused on for this presentation. But our scope three emissions, we can definitely share that if you're happy to share that. Yeah, moment. great. That that would be good. From, from the residents I've talked to, it, it's it's the waste that mm -hmm. everyone okay. is most conscious of, mm -hmm. and it's a scene that the waste tonnage is significantly higher than any of your scope one and two emissions. The emissions from the waste is red, is lower, is a lot lower compared to the energy emissions, um, but the tonnage is, yeah, the tonnage is the. I think if you incinerate, say, 200 tonnes of, mm -hmm. of, of waste, then you're going to generate at least 200 tonnes of emissions, so which would dwarf your your Scope one and two. We I use think. the DEFRA conversion factors. So I will, yeah, once I've done the DEFRA conversion factors, yeah, I'll definitely I've got them. I do have them in the office. But thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I thought that'd be an interesting figure to see once yeah. it's available. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've got Councillor Umpufu Coles. Oh, it's on. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to zoom more on the point of uh, safeguarding, especially for young people. My point is not to pull up the off the rug for the massive, huge operational that you do and all the amazing festival things that you do for young people, which puts Reading on the map. But as a mother of two young, uh, young daughters and also somebody who goes to festival and musical places, I wanted to find out specifically um, the success of ask uh, for Angela, how how you measure that uh, on the basis of looking at how many incidents, especially for women who came forward to say uh, to say the word Angela, uh, how you monitor that and get your reports from the people that are around the campus uh, on those issues. The question of safety for women is very, very important. And looking at the fact that there are also young people who are not adults attending one less than 18 years, uh, spiking of drinks, which can make it very, very difficult for somebody to even utter the word Angela or to be able even to move when they're paralyzed uh, when it comes to spiking uh, on that. So. It is uh, important to talk about those things because the safeguarding uh, uh, has got issues to do with sexual molestation, other things, sexual abuse. Uh, it might be touching, it might be doing other things, which is a very topical issue at the moment in so many ways. It has always been topical, but it hasn't been said enough. So I would like us to zoom on that and try and figure out how we can better do things to safeguard young people and their mothers who are probably worried or fathers or parents or carers uh, when young people go to festival. You can't stop them to go to festival, but you actually need to know that 
at least there's some safety measures being done on those issues that are very, very concerning. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Did you want to answer that now? Um, I think I'd start off by saying that um, I do completely acknowledge what you're saying, that we have got parents involved in this, um, we've got councils involved in this, and we've also got the people that attend our festivals. And I think we use a number of comms. I know you're obviously saying about reassurance, which can come prior to the show and while they're at our show. So I think the one thing that we would want to say is that we are ahead of the ball on these things. We were a Thames Valley Police. We very much know that these things are in headlines. They're happening in the world and we need to acknowledge them and we need to lead on them. We don't want to hide away from them. So I think from the start, we, from our SAG meetings and from our police meetings, we're planning on these things and we're working with any sort of intel that we have of how we deal with these measures. So we take that from the moment that people enter site, our searching, our profiling, watching people that come on in. Um, we've got a number of industry experts that can identify people in the crowds as they come on through. So that's going on in the background. As they come into site, we obviously have security across site, as well as zone managers and campsites. We've got a number of intel and that feeds into our wider event control rooms, which has got CCTV across sites. So there's a rounded operation that goes on to that, but zoning in deeper, I think it needs to be a focus. I think it's that, as we said from the start, it's um, leading on that, knowing these things can happen and how do we fight against them. So we always aim to make it better. Um, I think we've done great this year to do that, working with the Vogue campaign, the Ask for Angela, Safe Cakes for Women, all of these, we ask these partners to help us lead on them as well as. So it's because it's a joint partnership, it goes so well. And that's what we're so proud of at Reading Festival. We have a joint safeguarding partnership. So our reassurance to that is that um, it's our focus. We, we want two things out of our festival. We want the enjoyment of our ticket holders. And the second thing is to keep them safe while they're there. Um, these things that we do talk about here can be a, a worldwide issue that we need to talk about. But of course, they can happen at our festival and we acknowledge they can. So how do we fight against that? Um, but I think our reassurance would be from all the things that we put in place, it's comms. Um, whether that's Facebook, whether that's our social media, whether, whatever that may be, we push that out there far and wide as possible. And then while, while on site, it's that we've got all of these things, they're visible. They're visibly out there, they're tabards, they're, our safe case of women are out, they're proactive, they're not just there waiting for people to approach them, they're going, they're being proactive, they're talking, they're spreading the word, they're, the signage that you've seen on the uh, main screens, it's asking people to look out for yourself and your friends. So it's a joint, it's a joint thing that we try to motivate and work with. Just, uh, thanks Charlotte could I just um, actually it's a bit of a pat on the back for Charlotte as well as an example of what we do um, one of the things we've had a problem with is illegal river transport and effectively uh, pirates on the river um, and it was quite surprising uh, a how difficult it was to bring the various groups together and I think we had what nine groups was it that were involved in, uh, in, in, in terms of agencies interested in river safety um, but we did bring them together and we had a series of meetings which basically meant and, and if anybody's interested the number of boats that aren't licensed on the river is quite scary that aren't registered at all um, and we've had a problem with those boats in the past picking up our, our, our festival goers saying oh we'll take you a, we'll give you a lift for five pounds and then charging them to get back off the boat which we picked up and, and I'm just using this as an example because it's, it's like beating, eating a big cake. We're gradually eating into that cake and looking at different aspects of the festival that we can make safer. Um, and with the cooperation of all those authorities, you know, the, the Rivers Authority, the Environment Agency, uh, the uh, River Police, et cetera, et cetera, and all this that Charlotte was involved in, um, we've sort of taken, I wouldn't say we've taken away that risk, but we've massively mitigated that risk. And, and that's just one example of eating into what is a, a, a societal problem, but in terms of Reading Festival, we're just trying to take away bit by bit the risks and, and provide a safer festival. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I mean, obviously Reading Festival is, is, is one part of the experience the festival goers have, but they also come with their knowledge and experience from wherever they come from around the country, around the world. So the message has to be outside of the festival around treating women and, and young people well, treating our environment well. I mean, you know, these are the these are the next generation that are going to take up the baton around climate change, around climate action, around community safety. So the, the, you can do so much but the rest of it also has to come from the wider community of the United Kingdom and across Reading. I've just got uh, Councillor Dennis and um, then I'll come back. Unless it's about this point. 
It is, it is okay. still because I didn't get the answer about how many incidents were actually registered where women have actually come forward to either your agency, your security or somebody working there and said, Angel, because that will tell you that actually people are using that app or know about the app and then as years go by, you can still coordinate the numbers and see effectively whether it's working. That's a very good point and we will take it forward to formally record it. Obviously, they're coming to a whole variety of people that are presenting in different places at the moment in terms of our festival. We haven't got a record of how many people asked Angela, um, but I think that's something going forwards we'll look at recording because I think that's a useful figure to have. So thank you. And I think just to pick up on, on Councillor Mpufu Cole's point, did you do you have you don't have to say it now if it's more suitable for part two, but do you record the number of people that go into the, the safety tents, rough numbers for street pastors and all that sort of thing? Yes, it's a short answer. What we don't pick up is the Ask Angela who may be, for instance, to a guard outside of security. Sorry, a member of security is outside one of the bars because that's not necessarily, but once they go into one of the hubs, that is recorded, yes. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dennis, you've remembered. I'll be very, very quick. Um, yeah, just just uh, and referring to the, the point made made by um, Councillor Mapushu Coles about safeguarding is a very young um, audience in Reading Festival. It's one of the youngest, I, I, I understand. So, you know, there's some children there, basically. Um, but my question was in to do with the ticket checks as you were going in. I noticed I noticed that when you're going into arena, everything is solid. Yeah. But when you're going in and out of the campus itself, um, it was very variable. Some ticket, you know, people weren't being checked for tickets. I just thought there's something that you might want to look at going forward just to get your sampling up sampling numbers up a bit, you know. Yes, totally. Um, two things out of that is oh, loud. Um, is that you said about our demographic, very, very young, and we acknowledge that. Um, and that's what we work with with the right planning of safeguarding. That's why it's so important to us. Um, but it's also so important to the kids that do attend because they've just done their GCSEs, they've come to enjoy the festival, and it's our job to keep them safe. Um, and then obviously moving on to our search lanes is a question that's been asked. Sort of move on that one. Um, we have a search policy that is signed off for Thames Valley Police and Reading Borough Council, and that is what we work with when we're there. Um, searching we know is um, a major, major part of our festival because from the get-go it's when they come in, isn't it? We also, alongside that of searching, we have things to take into consideration such as safety around that. It's quite a small area that we work with around that space that as people back up onto the gates, they are coming onto the road. So it isn't just at that point, can we search them? There is a bigger picture that as a festival organiser, sorry, festival organiser, we have to look at. So there might be times when you have seen that searching hasn't taken place, but there is a reason for it. But um, within that, it isn't just the physical search and there is profiling going on. There are a number of things, CCTV. So thank you. Thank you very much. I haven't seen any more indications. So what I, oh, sorry, sorry, Councillor Rowland. Just quickly before we move to part two. Um, apologies, Jan. I don't want to. I don't want to uh, belabor this anymore. But um, I did. I did uh, pick up some points from uh, a colleague of ours that that attended and attended every year. And actually, it's no longer on this committee, but uh, usually uh, uh, gives you a good list of numbers this sh of of issues and everything to address this year. And I just like to just kind of highlight some of them. Uh, he spoke about overcrowding for the final headline acts, uh, how that was being dealt with. Now that to me goes kind of back to what Councillor Dennis uh, spoke about with possibly with the ticketing or that that kind of situation. Uh, the uh, possibly reopening the Little John's Farm entrance exit, which could allow for more mobility and, and all of that. So that was another thing. In terms of safety, the Thames Promenade lighting, can that be improved? Um, and um, another <clears throat> another point that he did pull up was something apparently that was discussed uh, with uh, the Leeds Council and possibly the Leeds Festival about uh, unaccompanied 16 and 17 year olds uh, by um, unaccompanied by an adult. Uh, we do realize it's a very young festival, but apparently it might have been discussed with you all uh, in reference to Leeds. So it's something I did kind of want to 
ask if it has not been discussed, then certainly uh, because obviously that would have a big impact on the audience. But uh, those were the primary points, but thank you. Uh, disability viewing platforms a bit too far away. I've been I've been uh, we've been weaving a thread about disability uh, viewing platforms or disabilities all evening. So yeah, so that's just a note takeaway. Thank you. Sorry. Can I can I just pick up some of those and I'll, yeah, I'll probably we can leave some the to, list as well. I'll, can I just pick up some of those um, overcrowding? Um, you know, we designed the arena to cope with the number. Clearly, if we've got one hundred and five thousand ticket holders, it is going to be a it's a big event. The reason we put you know, sort of barriers, which has been, if anybody's been following, we used to have a straight barrier that just went across in front of the stage. That's evolved into a fairly complex system of barriers now. Um, and, and that is all about, even though it's crowded and you've got crowd surfing and, you know, maybe, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people very close to the stage. I'm not saying it's perfect. That is all very much designed to make sure the crowd is safe, even though they may be at a density of four per square meter, five per square meter. It's about, you know, having access to them and, and making sure that we can see what's happening with the crowd. If you're not used to, and more other, one of the things we faced, particularly this year and to a degree less last year maybe, is inexperienced festival goers. I know they're very young, but some of them haven't been anywhere before and they've barely been out of their bedrooms because they've been taught on Zoom, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we have had maybe less festival savvy festival goers and they're not used to being out. It's not just about festivals, it's actually just being exposed and that, has been, you know, it's on the news if you listen to the news in terms of the way people act. If I could just pick up um, Little John's farm question. Um, I can, I've been doing the festival for just under 30 years. I can't remember us using Little John's farm with, well, I was going to say Little John's farm gate, which, but Orange Gate, we, we've used, one of them we've not used for years. The other one um, we didn't use because actually it became dangerous for festival goers. Um, they cross the road to go to Tesco's. Tesco's aren't co cooperative with us. Um, you know, it's not safe. It's not a safe area. It's very poorly lit. I mean, clearly we could light it. We used it this year to, for ingress because it helped us. But actually, I don't. I don't think there's a really strong argument for using Orange Gate and as an in and out because you know we're risking people. People, as you probably know, drive down that road much too fast. Um, then just picking up the other thing, Tim, Tom's Thames Prom lighting. Um, definitely, yes, that is something we looked at and we picked up and we will look at improving that. Thank you. Lovely, thank you. Although we are maybe putting in a new pedestrian crossing on Pullman Road for where Orange Gate used to be. So things are getting a bit safer, but the, the, I suppose the demographic of the area has changed. We have got new housing, so I'm not sure how appreciative they'd be of P festival goers traipsing through their um, communal gardens. I don't know, we'll think about it. I think some of the point was that obviously the businesses on the Oxford Road don't get the benefit so much from the, the festival and there's obviously that distribution of wealth throughout the town. Caversham gets it, Town Centre gets it, but as poor Oxford Roaders we, we don't get it so much anymore. But anyway we'll move on because it is getting late. So we are going to move on to part two and I have to read out some special words and they are uh, that pursuant to section 100A of the Local Government Act 1972, as amended, members of the press and public be excluded during consideration of the following items on the agenda, as it is likely that there would be disclosure of exempt information as defined in the relevant paragraphs of part one and schedule 12A as amended of the Act. Now, I don't think there are any of those people, <laughs> but we need, obviously need to turn the broadcast off. Well, yeah, if anyone wants to stretch their legs, grab a drink, literally one minute. I need, I need some water. 